Hello, I'm Charlie Rossiter, and welcome to Poetry Spoken Here on YouTube. We're the longest-running all-poetry interview podcast in existence. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. But you don't have to wait for YouTube uploads. You can also download the show from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to this all new episode of Poetry Spoken Here. I am producer and technical director Jack Rossiter Munley. And very quickly before we get into the episode, I just wanted to mention as always that Poetry Spoken Here is produced by Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated, a small digital production company making podcasts about poetry, literature, and cultural history. You can find out more about Poetry Spoken Here and all of the other Cardboard Box Productions podcasts at cardboardboxproductionsinc.com. And, most excitingly, Cardboard Box Productions also has a newsletter called Unboxed that you can subscribe to, and that's a great place to get more information about the poets and writers featured on Poetry Spoken Here, and the people, poems, and subjects featured on all of the other Cardboard Box shows. So again, that's the newsletter Unboxed that you can subscribe to from CardboardBoxProductionsInc.com. On with the show. I'm Charlie Rossiter, and this is Poetry Spoken Here. Our featured poet today is B.K. Tom, who began life in Cambodia and will be reading poems that talk about that life, his experiences coming here to the United States, and ultimately ending up a professor of English at Union College in Schenectady, New York. He'll be reading from his new book, Gruel, just published by New York Quarterly Press. Then, an anthology of poems about depression entitled, I Just Hope It's Lethal, will be reviewed. I'm Charlie Rossiter, and this is Poetry Spoken Here. Our featured poet today is Bun Kun Tun. He was born in Cambodia in the early 1970s, just before the Khmer Rouge takeover. They left Cambodia, his grandmother, and extended family, and spent some time in refugee camps in Thailand. They were fortunate enough to get to the United States so that he grew up in Malden, Massachusetts in the 1980s. He's now an associate professor of English at Union College in Schenectady, a much published poet, and has just had his first full-length collection, Gruel, published by New York Quarterly Books. So, welcome to the show, BK. Well, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to be here. Okay. I had asked you to send me some poems. So I'm wondering, what were you thinking of when you picked the poems that you picked? Well, I I wanted to give your listeners an idea of uh, the kind of poetry that I do, uh, which is um, a very personal. Uh, I think of Gruel as a a novel in, in verse, actually an autobiography in, in verse. Um, and so, you know, the, the three or four poems that uh, I will read uh, today, uh, they, they touch uh, an important sort of aspect of my life. And ha that has to do with loss and recovery in family. Uh, and uh, so I, that's, that's, you know, I just wanted to give your uh, listeners, uh, you know, what is important for me. Great. That sounds like exactly um, the kind of thing poetry so often does. I mean, it's really, well, our, the kind of poetry you write reveals the person and uh, what's significant, what's on your mind, and uh, what matters to you and what has mattered to you. Uh, you start, the first, well, in the order that you sent them to me, I just left them that way. And you started with a poem called Under the Tamarind Tree. So we certainly start with, with a tragic event in your life, uh, your mother's death. Um, would you read that poem? Uh, absolutely. Um, under the tamarind tree, the child sits on the lap of his aunt under the old tamarind tree outside the family home. The tree stands still, quiet, indifferent. The house sways on stilts. Monks in saffron robes and nuns with shaved heads, lips darkened with betel nut stain, sit chanting prayers for the child's mother. 
Incense perfumes the hot, dry air. There emerges a strange, familiar song between the child and his aunt that day. A distant one, melodic but harsh, as if the strings are drawn too tight. Each time the child hears prayers coming from the house, he cries. Each time he cries, the aunt, a girl herself, pinches the boy's thigh. It starts us not only at that event, but uh, but back in uh, Cambodia, correct? Yes, absolutely. The, as the writer, um, there is a moment of loss, I think, my, my kind of writing. I think Kafka talks about this uh, too. There's, there's some sort of pain that that happens. And for me, this was the original moment. Uh, there's the loss of a mother. And then uh, when the Khmeru regime collapsed uh, and we fled uh, to the refugee camps in Thailand, it's the loss of the motherland of the country. Uh, and for me, uh, this poem is really is the beginning and, uh, and writing is a way of recovering uh, that loss. And if you know anything about the Khmeru regime, uh, they, they got rid of educated people, uh, teachers, professors, and also people who are affected by, quote unquote, uh, affected uh, or infected by Western capitalism, bankers, uh, uh, businessmen. But another sort of important aspect is the, the loss of, uh, of, of religion, of Buddhism. And monks were sort of either killed or forced to be uh, lay people. But in, in this poem, I wanted to give my mother a proper funeral so you see monks and nuns uh, giving her this uh, mm -hmm. uh, this funeral. So it was a conscious attempt to uh, to be anachronistic in the poem. This is a little hard to ask you, I think. Is there something you could tell us more for people who aren't familiar with what was going on at that time? Well, uh, uh, the Khmer uh, took over Cambodia uh, in April 1975. And the regime collapsed in, um, in January 1979. And in a period of almost four years, uh, you know, people were uh, uh, the people were sort of associated with the old uh, government, the Lenol government. Uh, they were quickly uh, dispatched, disappeared, killed. Uh, and then the rest of us, uh, most of us, you know, were farmers. Uh, and, and the country uh, and city people were sent to sort of the countryside to work. Uh, and basically, uh, you know, people were uh, worked to death. Uh, my mother, uh, she was worked uh, and, and she uh, basically uh, died from exhaustion and hunger uh, and illness. You know, the stories that I received, I inherited from my uncles and aunts and grandmother. Uh, but, you know, I'm also a professor. And I, and I teach this uh, type of literature. Uh, there's, there's a personal connection in all of this, in, in my work and, and what I do as a writer and teacher. Let's move to a very positive poem that involves your grandmother. I've got a thing. I, th I think that there's a real thing about grandmothers because I heard it in, in so many varied poems. Yours is in Cambodia. And then Jimmy Baca out in New Mexico, he's got a killer grandmother poem with fundamentally the same kind of idea that she's, you know, grandmother love is what gets you through and makes you strong and that sort of thing. So I, I just loved it when I came across this poem and it's the title poem of, of your new book, Gruel. You know, this this poem is, is one of those sort of magical poems where you uh, you basically receive it you know, right there and then uh, while you're sort of, you know, I was uh, helping my uncles and aunts clean uh, uh, the the house after a party. And my uncle told me this story and I wrote it down there and then and it didn't really change much. But anyway, I'm talking too much. Let me just read the poem. We were talking about survival when my uncle told me this. When you were young, we had nothing to eat. Your grandmother saved for you the thickest part of her rice gruel. Tasting that cloudy mixture of salt, water, and grain, you cried out. 
This is better than beef curry. All my life, I told myself I never knew suffering under the regime, only love. This is still true. It's nice to think that it can have that kind of power because so many atrocities were happening around you back then and uh, that this powerful memory is there. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I've, I'm a very lucky person. Uh, I, I lost my parents, uh, first my mother and then my father afterward, uh, but I was loved and sheltered uh, by my grandmother. I, you know, I didn't witness or understood the atrocity that was happening. Uh, and I think that I had to do a lot with my grandmother. So a lot of my, my poems are about her and Gruel is a dedication to her. Uh, she passed away last year before the book came out. Yeah, you know, actually having read your whole the whole book, I know you, you mentioned being lucky in a couple of other poems, as a matter of fact. And there was a, I, I agree. <laughs> You'd have to be lucky to be here now, uh, teaching in Schenectady and doing doing what you're doing. Uh, this other poem is about uh, is something that uh, people who always have had snow in their lives probably uh, have never come anywhere close to this experience. I don't know what would be the equivalent. Uh, your first monsoon? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, let, let's hear that one. First snow. We huddle behind the back door of our sponsor's house. My uncle, the bravest because he spoke a little English, went out. My grandmother, aunts, and I watched him through the kitchen window. He bent down, reached for the whiteness of this new world, and put some in his mouth. He looked back at us and smiled. We can make snow cone with this. America, the miraculous, our savior, you were the land of dreams then. When, when, you, when you say America like that, it reminds me of Ginsburg. Yeah. Because <laughs> he threw that into poems so often. And by the way, let's talk about Bukowski a little bit. Because in one of your poems, you mentioned how he, he changed your life. You went back to school because of Charles Bukowski. Yes, uh, Bukowski saved my life. I was a college dropped out. Uh, I dropped out of Bunkley Hill Community College um, in Massachusetts. And then we moved to Long Beach, California. My uncles and aunts were pursuing the Cambodian version of the American dream. Uh, they were you know, in the process of buying a donut shop in Long Beach, California. I was working uh, as a janitor um, in Long Beach. And then one particular morning, I decided to go visit the library, uh, the local library. It was the Dana, I think it was the Dana Branch, no, Dana Public Library in, in Long Beach. And you know, I stumbled into this aisle and I, I, I just picked the first book and it was by Bukowski. It was called, uh, oh my, something along the line of play the piano until your fingers begin to bleed, uh, something like that. Yeah. And, um, and it opened my eyes because one, you know, I didn't need to be trained to read and understand what was going on in the poems. Uh, there was clarity. And two, the people that he talked about were not kings and princesses and queens and important figures. They were people on the margin, and I felt like I was sort of outsider. I still do. Uh, you know, I, I teach at a liberal arts college, uh, and I didn't even know that there's such a thing as a private college. Anyway, going back, you know, because Bukowski talked about other writers like Dostoevsky, the great Russians, uh, for mm. example, and they introduced me to other writers. And from there on, I, I went back to school. I enrolled in Long Beach uh, City College, uh, got my degree in English, transferred to Cal State Long Beach, and then went to uh, graduate school in the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and got my PhD in comparative literature. 
but I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to tell my stories because because can do it. Why can't I? Uh, and 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 uh, you know, I didn't get a chance. Well, I, I wrote a couple of stuff, but I was afraid. I was too embarrassed because I wanted to. Uh, you know, get an academic job and uh, and, and, and and make a living and mm-hmm. survive because I didn't want to starve. I you know, there's this image of the starving artist. I knew what starvation was under the community regime, so I didn't want to go through that again. So I, I played it safe, and then after I you know got a job, I start writing, writing seriously. Bukowski can gives you the courage or encouragement to just just tell your story. I think read a couple of his stories. Think of some incident in life and say, "Yeah, you can write a poem about that. Nothing's off limits." Absolutely, that's exactly you know why I was attracted to Bukowski. Uh, anything uh, can be uh, material for good poetry, um, and you know the language again, the accessibility of it that uh, that got me into the world. When I get a little bit analytical with him, I also I think I've decided he really knows what he's doing with the line breaks. It may look like he's not doing anything and the words are just dribbling down the page, but I think he's way more conscious than people maybe have given him credit for, technically. It's a, a visual aesthetic to, to the poetry and some of the line breaks that do sort of emphasize the imagery uh, and the you know, sort of the voice and tone, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's get back to another one of your poems here. Uh, that one about uh, your ritual with your grandmother. Still water. My grandmother and I had this ritual. Whenever I visited, I drove her to a local state park off of Route 1. Her left hand gripped a walking stick, while the other held on to me. Bikers and joggers flew past us with good morning or good afternoon. On these walks, we talked about Grandpa, who didn't raise his voice at her until the very end. Her only living sibling, the younger sister in Cambodia she would never see again. Then she asked about my job, a professor at a private college. She wanted to know how students and colleagues were treating me. My aunt said that these walks were good. They got her to leave the house. Then one afternoon in spring, a group of teenagers saw us walking. Hey, one of the kids yelled, I had Chinese food last week. This girl told him to stop, but he kept insisting that he loved it. Not a violent slur, but enough to drag up things said and done to me at that age. Something about coming from a country so poor we had to eat dogs or use leaves to wipe our asses. About being pushed around and spat at walking home from school. But I was now a professor in my 30s with a doctorate in literature. My body shook. Grandmother squeezed my right hand and said, don't pay them any attention. Let's keep walking. We're almost near our spot where the boulder overlooks the still water of the lake. Look, the trout swims below us. I love that trout. It's just such a, such a real thing. And, uh, and your grandmother's effort to get you off of thinking about that other thing. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, now that I don't have her anymore, I would go back to these poems and read them out loud uh, mm. as a way to remember, to remind myself of how lucky I was to have her in my life, uh, what she was like. Uh, she, you know, didn't have any kind of education, but she was able to raise you know, six kids on her own after her husband passed away. She was a very strong person. Was there a lot of uh, stuff you had to take when you were in school as a kid here in the States? Uh, it, it wasn't like, yeah. you know, it, it, it wasn't so, so bad. I mean, you know, it was just sort of racial slurs that were thrown at me. Uh, at one point, you know, a kid wanted to beat me up, uh, but uh, another kid sort of protect me from that. I think what was really painful for me was that uh, this was 1980s in uh, Malden, Massachusetts. There were not a lot of Asians around, let alone Cambodians. And I just felt this complete 
alienation from mm. the peers, from the teachers and the principal. Uh, I I just I just felt outside looking in uh, in 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 terms of the world of mainstream uh, you know, middle school high school sort of culture. Um, you know, so it, it really did a damage on me, uh, and I, you know, I, I stopped thinking, I stopped writing. I, I mean, I stopped sort of doing homework. I almost flunked out of high school. It was, it was bad, and I think if I was one of those sort of people who, who were conscious of, of being so different. Yeah, you know, that was tough, and that's why going back to Bukowski, when you read about. You know, someone who lives sort of in a bungalow and you know, uh, not really participating in the mainstream culture, you, you can relate to that. And for me, that was very, that was loud and clear when I read his stories and his poetry. And his, uh, his wonderful uh, memoir, uh, Ham and Rye, was just beautiful. Uh, it was painful. Yukowski, you know, was an outsider in terms of his relationship with his father, in terms of his acne problem, uh, and I, I could relate to that. I'm imagining you came. How, how much English did you have when you arrived here in the states? Not at all. Yeah, not so. at all. There's a poem uh, in my my book about not knowing what snow day was. I just walked to school and like, you know, where's everybody? Uh, and you, there's a certain things that people know about, and I just didn't know. I mean, my uncles and aunts were busy, uh, you know, working at plants and factories, and my grandmother was taking care of the little ones. And you know, we didn't know anything about stuff like that. As simple as snow day, we didn't know that. Uh, so there's a poem about that in, in the uh, Revere, Massachusetts section. Yeah, I remember now that you mentioned it. We got another poem here, so let's finish with that one. And I. I imagine you put that in. Be, I'm guessing because it's a it's a piece of of the old culture that people try to hang on to, the fishing. I am fascinated by my uncles and aunts. Uh, you know, they continue to go fishing. I remember at the beginning they they didn't know how to read and write uh, English, uh, so I, I really wondered how the heck were they able to find these fishing spots in. You know, in, in, in New Hampshire and Maine and Rhode Island and Connecticut, uh, they're able to drive. I, I never imagined, I, I, I don't have any memory of them getting lost. They're just able to find places to fish. And you're right, it, it, you know, that's this is the, the lifestyle that they're familiar with. And this particular poem is a kind of literary documentation of really the immigrant world. Um, okay, I'll, I'll read it Fishing for Trey Plateau. You might have seen them fishing on the shores of the Cape Cod Canal. My uncle in his fisherman hat, pulling in a one-foot scup. My aunt in her pajama-like pants, walking backward up the bike path, snapping a line that's got stuck between the rocks. My other aunt reeling in a sea bass, her husband by her side directing. Bikers, jockers, teenagers and their dates, families with their children look curiously on. Or maybe you've seen them lining up all three sides of a pier in Salem, their wrists jerking in a language that bewitches the squids below. They are not the only ones. Other Cambodians and Vietnamese, once enemies, fish side by side on the same American pier. Other immigrants, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, speaking languages that I can't understand, come together on this spot sacred rods and hands, beckoning the squid. Or maybe you've seen them under a bridge fishing the Providence River, looking for tre plateau, a type of mackerel, like they used to eat in the refugee camps in Thailand. Sometimes my aunts and uncles run into an old friend from those long ago days to talk about the lack of food, of sneaking out at night to fish, and of running always running from the Thai police. They exchange phone numbers, share fishing secrets, and set up a time and place where they'll fish together again. When they get home, my aunts cut the fish, 
clean them, fry them, and put them in boiling stew with galangal, lemongrass, and kaffir leaves. My uncle and aunt sit in a circle on the floor, eat and tell stories of how this fish got away or how one of them got caught by the Thai police. No matter how hard they try, they could never understand why my cousin and I ever bother with fishing, why we catch and release food as if it's some sport. Yeah, that really is culturally revealing. Back in the old country, there were tension uh, between people. But once we're in America, especially with the, the, the young generation, we're in the same situation. We're put in an ESL uh, classroom. Uh, we, we go through the same sort of difficulty of adjusting. So we become friends, uh, Vietnamese, Cambodians, uh, Thais, Laos, we're all together. Well, it's been really great talking with you. I'm glad you could make it to be on Poetry Spoken here. We've been talking with B.K. Ton. He's from Schenectady, New York. Be with us again next time for Poetry Spoken Here. You're listening to Poetry Spoken Here. You know, getting books online can be efficient if you know ahead of time what you want. On the other hand, there's a lot to be said for the serendipity of physically browsing library shelves. I was at my public library recently, just looking around the poetry shelves, and I came upon a book with a very interesting title. I just hope it's lethal. Poems of sadness, madness, and joy. It's an anthology of poems around the theme of depression, co-edited by Liz Rosenberg and Dina November. In their introductions, both editors talk about their own dealings with depression, which began in their teen years. Both talk about benefiting from writing about their personal experiences and from reading poems by others that address the topic. Although the book is not a new release, it's readily available online in both new and used editions. It's divided into five sections. The first is called Moods. Uh, One of the editors notes that her young son called it, that's about sadness without reason. And the very first poem in the book is by Margaret Atwood. It opens like this. A sad child. You're sad because you're sad. It's psychic. It's the age. It's chemical. Go see a shrink or take a bill. Or hug your sadness like an eyeless doll you need to sleep. Well, all children are sad, but some get over it. Count your blessings. Better than that, buy a hat, buy a coat or pet. Take up dancing to forget. It goes on, elaborating, defining sadness. And the second poem is by William Blake. A tremendous range of poets in this book, from the extremely well-known to up-and-coming contemporary poets. From William Blake, Infant's Sorrow. This is the entire poem. It's in public domain. My mother groaned, my father wept. Into the dangerous world I leaped. Helpless, naked, piping loud, like a fiend hid in a cloud. Struggling in my father's hands, striving against my swaddling bands. Bound and weary, I thought best to sulk upon my mother's breast. The second of the five sections are poems that address the deranged state of the world. That's what the editors call it. Things like the insanity of war, cruelty, injustice. Das Lanzalotti contributes a poem called In the Booby Hatch. And I'll just give you the essence of it. In the Booby Hatch. The only difference between the crazies and the staff is the color of the shirts. In a later section, some of the poems are about describing the state of insanity. I found it interesting that they include one of Sylvia Plath's very well-known and very powerful poems, Lady Lazarus, in which she talks about her multiple attempts at suicide. Sylvia Plath. 
Lady Lazarus. I've done it again. One year in every ten, I manage it. A sort of walking miracle. My skin bright as a Nazi lampshade. My right foot a paperweight. My face a featureless fine Jew linen. Later, two stanzas that really stand out. Dying is an art, like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say, I've a call. Lest we end on on too depressing a note, the editors give us a final section that talks about the positive experience of coming up out of a bad time. And uh, among the poems in there, by the wonderful short story writer Raymond Carver, and uh, he was diagnosed with cancer and it was quite a while that he knew he was going to die. It was terminal, but he kept writing. This poem is called Late Fragment. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. A few poems from a very interesting collection called I Just Hope It's Lethal, poems of sadness, madness, and joy. I'm Charlie Rossiter, and this has been Poetry Spoken Here. You've been listening to Poetry Spoken Here. I'm Charlie Rossiter, inviting you to join us again next time to let poetry speak to you. Music for today's program was written and performed by Jack Rossiter Mundley. And remember, Poetry Spoken Here is more than a podcast. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash poetry spoken here. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash poetry spoken here. For more about today's show and other Poetry Spoken Here podcasts, as well as our blog, just visit our website, poetryspokenhere.com. If you'd like to submit suggestions of poets or topics for future podcasts, you can send to our email address, poetryspokenhere at gmail.com.